Thank you, Tyler. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I love the comment in the chat box that says, I don't know what the bottom one is, but I'm seeing it everywhere. Um, so we're happy to know that you are starting to see these birds and that they're coming back. These are both species that breed on the front range in Colorado. Specifically, they both breed at the Chatfield uh, Nature Center, um, Audubon Nature Center at Chatfield. Um, this top one, oops, is um, an American red start um, who will have wintered down in Mexico and will be returning to our part of the woods probably in a couple, we'll start to see them early to mid-May. And then the bottom one is a gray catbird, um, which is probably, most of them are still down in Texas and they're working their way back here. So just getting us started. I want to um, just quickly introduce ourselves. I'm Meredith McBurney and I have been running the Bird Conservancy Spring Migration Banding Station at Chatfield since 2005, which is the entire time that it has been at its current location. It means I have learned a lot about migrating birds in the spring and also I have just a whole bunch of questions still remaining about things I don't know. Um, Tyler Cash um, is our camp and community coordinator, and he is also, I think, the father of these webinars, um, and he is acting as our host and troubleshooter. And Stacy's over on Facebook, um, joining us with some additional people this morning. We're going to be recording this webinar, as we always do, so don't worry about scrambling to take notes. It'll be up on the YouTube channel in a couple of days. We will also provide you with a PowerPoint with a PDF of the slides in case there's specific information that you'd like to review. There will be some opportunities during this time period to um, respond. We're going to do one poll. We're going to do a couple of quizzes, um, and we are also going to um, take questions. If you have a question as I'm babbling away, something I'm not clear about, please let us know. Um, Tyler will either respond right away, he will ask me the question so that we get it clarified, or we'll take the questions at the end. Those of you who've been on these webinars, webinars have seen this slide before, we use it every time. It's our opportunity to tell you that our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. And then drop down to the last sentence on this page because this is the most important sentence related to our PowerPoint, our presentation this morning. Our work radiates across the breeding, wintering, and migratory ranges of birds. And that's what we're here for today. Okay, now I want you, we're going to go on a little pretend journey. We're going to pretend that instead of sitting here in the comfort of our homes watching this webinar this morning, that we have decided to go on a little hike. It's a beautiful day, the sun is shining, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and we are going to pretend that we all live on the front range in the Denver metro area. And we've decided to go to the Carson Nature Center. Those of you who live in this area know that it's on the South Platte River, um, out Santa Fe, almost to C-470. And it's a lovely place to look for birds, especially during the week when there aren't too many people around. So. We're out, it's beautiful. The water is, the sun's shining off the water and we're listening to the red-winged blackbirds starting to sing and the ubiquitous black-capped chickadees. And then we hear this.
And we say, what the heck is that? And this is our little quiz of the morning. And I'm gonna play it again. And while I play it again, I want you to all vote. Um, you either, yes, I know what bird this is. No, I don't know what bird this is. Or maybe I think I've heard it before. Okay, thanks everybody. That is really great um, to have that feedback. And what we found out that it is that most of us don't know what this bird song is, but we're out at Carson Nature Center in the early spring and we're really lucky because the trees aren't full of leaves yet. And this bird is probably pretty close and it seems to be sitting in one place. And we may be able to figure out what it is by looking at it. So we're gonna take our binoculars. Um, let's see, how do I get the pole off of my screen? Just like that, okay. We're going to uh, little technical problem here, Tyler. Oh, there, sorry. All right, now we found the bird. And I suspect some of you um, have moved from the category of no, I don't know what this is to I do know what this is um, based on seeing these photos of this bird, really wonderful pictures taken by a great birder and photographer, Rob Raker. Um, but others, some of you are now recognize it, some of you still don't. And if you don't, what we're gonna do in the next two or three minutes is sort of go through further through the process of going from, I hear the birds singing, I wanna know what it is, and here's how I figure out what it is. So by the time I've ended my day, I'm just not thoroughly frustrated by a whole bunch of birds that I can't recognize. Um, so, if you don't know what this bird is, let's think about it in terms of family. So look at what this bird is doing at this moment in time, sitting out on the end of, in both cases, dead branches. Look how it's sitting. He sits up really tall. Um, he's, you can just imagine him moving his head around, looking for something that he may, might take off and grab out of the air. He's got that wide flat bill and you can almost in these photos see his whiskers. And all of that starts to tell you what family this bird is in. This, is, this bird is in the flycatcher family and I'll give the secret away. It is a says Phoebe. Now, if I were a relatively new birder, um, or even a more experienced birder who hadn't been doing this birding this spring yet, I would do something before I went out to the Carson Nature Center. I would go to eBirds. And I'm gonna talk off and on about eBirds today. And if you've never been on it, um, go on, look, explore it. Tons of information. But one of the things that it does is it has these bird hotspots and pretty much any place you're gonna go birding in Colorado is a hotspot now. And you can go on and see what birds are seen there at this time of year. And I've just put into the screen a piece of that, um, which, has the, which has all of the flycatchers, um, the family of flycatchers on it. So, um, but it has all the birds that are ever seen at Carson Nature Center. And then it has these bars that show the bigger the green bar, the more birds, the more of the species is being seen at some time during the year. You've identified as a flycatcher. You go look at this list. 
which starts, the flycatchers start at Western Wood Pee Wee and go down except for the bottom one on the page, which is Arvirio. The only one that you are likely to be seeing here at this time in April is a Sage Phoebe. So eBirds really helpful and having this information ahead of time, knowing which birds appear to be migrants and might be coming back at this time of year is really great and makes it easier to bird. If you were online and you clicked on the Sage Phoebe link, it would take you um, to a lot more information about, about this bird. And I highly recommend if we all have the time, which most of us don't, um, once you get home from birding to take a closer look at more information about these birds that are new to you. Um, it helps to keep it in your mind. It helps you to remember um, when you see or hear it again, um, whether it might be a sage phoebe or some other species. Most of this information is on eBirds or you could just Google sage phoebe um, on your computer and it would, one of the choices will be the Coronal Labs All About Birds, where you will see information about it being its migratory status, what it eats, um, and what they do. And this is an early migrant. He's one of the first birds back. And I was showing this to Tyler before we started. And he said, I was just out birding the other day and had the exact same spirit experience. Um, so, um, okay, having taken you through a little bit of what you, we all as birders do um, at this time of year, I want to take us back and talk a little bit more about science as it relates to migration. If you saw this webinar last the fall webinar on migration. I talked about Sibley's Guide to Bird Life and Behavior then. If you're a relatively new birder, this is a great book. Um, tells you a lot about the life history of birds and helps you to become situated as you're learning more about birds. And he describes migration as the regular movement of individuals between their breeding and wintering grounds. And he says migration is seasonal, predictable, and repeated each year. So birds fly, right? We know that they can move miles in a matter of minutes. Um, so there's a lot of other movement going on from time to time for birds. They, some of them will disperse a little bit because wherever they have hatched is too loaded up with birds. Um, they may move hundreds of miles one way or another um, during some time in the year for food, but it's um, a very different process than migration, which is this seasonal predictable and repeated annually. And millions of birds are doing this. This um, map is was done, focused on the boreal forest and it is the fall the arrows are showing what happens in the fall, but you move the lines around a little bit and turn it around and the same thing's happening in the spring. And if you look down at that um, in the bottom left-hand corner, just look at what it says, for example, for Mexico. You're talking about birds coming out of the boreal forest, which is that green area all the way across Canada and Alaska. And they're talking about 680 million birds ending up in Mexico. And then you're talking about all those birds coming back. Plus you're talking about adding in all the birds from the United States, whether you're in Colorado or Minnesota or California that are added to that all going down into um, the tropics for the winter and then coming back and we're really talking about lots of birds. Okay, so why do birds migrate? The um, sort of quick but scientific explanation is that migration occurs when the costs of migrating, which are really quite high, um, 
we'll talk a little bit about the dangers and the problems and everything that they uh, that occurs as birds are migrating. Um, they takes a lot of energy and a lot of birds die in the process, but the costs are lower to migrate um, than the benefits of using well separated breeding and wintering grounds. So this map and which is the range map for the yellow warbler, um, which we're gonna use a little bit as our example this morning. Um, they have that huge, huge, everything pale green is their, is their breeding territory. And all that blue, the little bit of blue is their um, wintering grounds. This all yellow warblers migrate. Um, and you can see the sort of pattern the lines and the dots in the middle have to do with birds that were banded one place and recaught someplace else, um, which has helped to develop this, um, these maps where we have some patterns. Um, there have not been a lot of them over the years, but there have been some. Anyway, these birds in the fall, they're com coming out of uh, Canada and Alaska, and most of the birds that are making this major journey all the way down into Central America and South America are doing it because their food is gone. And I find it really easy to understand as a human why they leave in the fall. Um, it's getting cold, the day, there's less daylight, pretty soon their food starts to go away. It's pretty easy to understand why they would leave. Um, I think spring is a little harder for us to understand. Oops, wrong direction. We're going to talk about that for a minute. One of the things that they have actually documented is that there is a greater rate of reproductive success for birds that are breeding in the temperate zones in the United States and Canada than there is in the tropics. Um, there's a lower density of nest predators and um, parasites, and there's less competition for breeding habitat and food. That's pretty obvious if you look at the map. If all these millions of birds from North America and Canada stayed in Central America and the northern part of South America in the wintertime, in the summertime to breed, plus all of the neotropical migrants, you just would just wouldn't be possible. So they're coming back. Um, less have less competition for their breeding habitat and food. And finally, there is tons of food as we come out of winter into spring, as insects are hatching, um, as our trees are starting to uh, produce fruit and um, other plants um, and seeds that the birds will eat. And there's just a huge abundance of food during the breeding cycle, during the breeding period. And birds that are migrating are aiming to be raising their young at the time when their food is most abundant. Quickly, who migrates and who doesn't? Um, the primary reason that these birds end up moving, we think is um, because of food. Um, and most insect eating birds migrate the farthest and they'll leave earlier in the fall and return later in the spring. Birds that are capable of eating seeds and berries, or birds that are able to find their insect prey in the wintertime. For example, birds that might peck into the wood bark of trees and pull out um, the larvae or something like that. These birds either don't migrate or they don't need to migrate as far. So just uh, let's take a look and think about a few of these birds. Um, you probably all recognize these. We have in the background is the black capped chickadee and up front is the mountain chickadee. Chickadees, generally speaking, are non-migratory birds. That isn't a very big beak, but anybody who's ever held one or tried to get one out of the nest net at a banding station knows that it's very strong. And they're at our feeders year round, they're highly adaptable, they cache seeds um, and none of them migrate. We are starting to see some movement. Um, I, in the back of my head, I hear somebody in the uh, audience today saying to themselves, wait, I'm starting to see mountain chickadees in my backyard in Inglewood. 
Um, and we are starting to see some movement of mountain chickadees into areas where they weren't maybe five, 10, however many years ago. I had my first mountain chickadees, I'm near downtown Denver um, in my yard this fall. I think that's dispersal. I think it's moving out of, they're looking for food. Um, they may be broadening their range, but that's not migrating. These two birds, um, the bottom one with that lovely red eye is a spotted towhee, and the upper bird is a song sparrow, are depending on their, depending on where they summer, um, will migrate some distance. Um, the song sparrows that live in the riparian areas around Denver are non-migratory. They're here year round. Um, they are already probably starting to breed. When we get out to Chatfield in another 10 days, um, the females will already be sitting on eggs. Um, they're, they're moving right along. Um, but there are song sparrows that breed further north that will come through during migration, especially in the fall. We'll see them, we'll catch them, and they'll go further south and then they'll return to their breeding area um, at about this time of year. They're early migrants um, because of their ability to eat a wider variety of foods. The towhees are interesting. They are primarily, the ones in our area are primarily non-migratory. We see them in the winter and the summer. Um, they are becoming more common in people's yards. You may be starting to see them in your yard. Um, I know from, our Nest Watch project, there, there are towhees breeding in yards in the south, southern part of the metro area. Um, and they seem to leave in the wintertime. I don't know if they're truly migrating or if they're just moving to other areas in order to find food and that sort of thing. Um, but it's a bird that, at least in our area, has primarily been non-migratory. But some of them do. And then on the other hand, we have this lovely yellow warbler, which is a true migrant. All of the warblers, almost all of the warblers anyway, um, migrate, they're insect eaters, they can't find food um, in the winter time and they go deep into Central America. Um, I wanna quickly pause here and tell you about a new book um, that is just a wonderful resource. Um, I got a copy of it last week. I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but if you are seriously interested in migration and you like to read people who are wonderful writers and can make even the most complicated scientific theories sound interesting and somewhat understandable, this is a great book. Um, just a couple of quotes. And this is to sort of really say to you, migration is something that we really don't understand very well. How a bird manages to move from one place to another over what could be thousands of miles and get where they're going we just don't understand it. And we're learning more all the time. He actually has, Scott Widensall has a chapter that he calls, we used to think. And then he goes on to talk about so many of the things that we're finding that weren't exactly quite accurate um, as we get more information and as the technology for figuring out what birds are doing um, improves. He says, in the past two decades, we've realized how badly we have underestimated the simple physical abilities of birds. They are born with a genetic roadmap that compels them to fly in a certain direction for a certain length of time at a certain time of year. I mean, that's really extraordinary. <laughs> it just makes you realize how great these wonderful little creatures are. So let's talk about what we do know about um, birds and how they migrate. Um, it's spring, they are down in Central America. They don't have 
the weather changes or the time changes or the amount of daylight changes to help them know that it's time to move, but they do have their hormones and they're starting to rage. They recognize at some level that they need to get back to their summer breeding grounds in the right time frame. That is when their food is most abundant so that they can raise their young. Before migrating, birds bulk up. We've known for decades that they put on fat. And in fact, if you've ever been out to the banding station, you have seen us show you the fat and we use it as a measure of whether or not the bird is healthy and is going to be able to make this arduous journey wherever it's going. But um, Scott's new book tells us that they also put on muscle mass. And he says that they do it without exercising. So we have birds who are able to put on fat and then lose it really quickly um, and that they can put on muscle mass without exercising. So um, I want to come back as a bird. He, um, he goes on to say that because birds muscle tissue is all but identical to humans, the trigger must be biochemical, but what it is remains a mystery. And the reason they're bulking up with fat and new muscle in the spring is because they want to get to their summer breeding grounds as quickly as possible. In the fall, they kind of meander. In the spring, they are moving. They wanna be the first ones back of their species to begin to um, identify their territories and protect it. Um, and I will talk a little bit in a minute about this concept of first out, last back. That is the ones that need to migrate first are the ones who are for sure, like the yellow warbler that are super insect eaters. Um, and they will, be, they will come back later um, than the birds that um, can eat seeds and have a more varied diet and that we will come back sooner. Um, okay, how am I doing on time? Okay. All right, so how do they know where to go when they're coming back? Well, many birds have something called site fidelity. Um, that is that they're going to return to a location that's very close to or at the place where they hatched or where they have successfully bred previously. And we've been tracking this phenomena with yellow warblers at the Chatfield Banding Station since it started in 2005. Um, and I want to take a minute to just tell you about one of these birds um, who is kind of an extreme example because he managed to live so long, um, but, is, but this is the pattern that they follow. So we got this yellow warbler down here in the left-hand corner, this adult male um, who we first caught in 2006. He's down there in our longevity hall of fame um, on that chart. He was banded with 2410-70848, and we caught him every year for the next 10 years. And, um, and then he didn't catch him again, but we know he got to be 10 years old, which is kind of like being about 95 in human years. So in my mind, he had a very peaceful passing with all of the many, many young birds that had um, that he had raised, he and his partner had raised over the years around him at the funeral. Um, sorry. Um, anyway, so this bird um, came back every year to Chatfield, every winter went down someplace in Central America. And we have one bird that we caught at the Chatfield station that was banded in Central America and it was banded in um, Costa Rica. So we use Costa Rica as the possible place where this bird started. And you can see on the chart, it's 2,419 and a half miles from Denver to San Jose, Costa Rica. Um, so this bird in a year annually is traveling about 5,000 miles in order to be able to live, survive, raise young and continue on. And so this bird did this at least 10 years. So part of it is just the distance, how the fact that they are capable of making that kind of journey. And as 
the author Scott says, um, we really don't appreciate the physicality of these, of these individuals, but it's also their ability to get to some place, probably the same place every year in Costa Rica or wherever, and then also get back. And I took a look at where this bird was caught over the 10 years that we had it. Um, and this is the map of their banding station. Um, it's not a very good space. Those of you who've been out there know it takes a few minutes to walk from one end to the other, but it's really not a huge area. And we caught it over the 10 years, some years once, some years four or five times, probably 30 times. And this area in red is where we caught him every single time. Now I suspect he gets out of that area. He probably goes out over that pond from time to time, from time a little bit during the season, but this is basically his summer home. Um, he may fly a long way in between, but he has, he has come back to this space and he's used it every year. My guess is there's a cottonwood there where he's had his nest every year, or he had his nest every year for all those years. Um, so it's really an interesting phenomena. Those of you who have birds in your backyard who leave in the winter and come back in the summer, um, they're sticking around your yard and your neighborhood probably all summer long. Okay. So how about the timing of spring migration? Um, I need to catch up with my notes here. Timing of spring migration. One of the things when we were talking about the definition of migration, we talked about how it was predictable um, and it is predictable. These birds tend to move. They start at the same time, move at the same pace. If they can, they want to start at the same time, move at the same pace over the course of the years. Um, and this is something to think about and consider as we think about climate change and the warming of the planet. Um, if we have the planet warming and we are going to have plants that are going to bloom earlier, um, they're going to fruit earlier, and the potential for the birds and the um, and their habitat to be off to be out of sync is very is very very high over some time period. Um, and what they're finding is they found some birds that are short distance migrants that are starting to compensate for this difference in when their food is available. But these long distance migrants really don't have, seem to have the ability to do that. And what we know about many of the warblers, and I believe it's true about the yellow warblers, is they're not really good about, they're not a really adaptable species. Um, Many of you have heard me talk about house wrens, which are highly adaptable species, and they move from forest to your backyard as long as they have a box to live in. But that's not true of, of, of species like yellow warblers. And they not only have specific needs in their wintering and summer grounds, but they also have specific needs during the other times of the year. And if you take away one of those specific needs, um, it tends to throw them off and uh, lower their chance of survival. And this is what we have been finding over 15 years that we've been looking at this. The arrival dates of the adult male yellow warblers tends to be around the 1st of May. The females are gonna arrive, start arriving about a week later. This really hasn't changed over this time period. Um, the adults, come first and the males come before the females. The adult males are the ones who have the best chance to breed and to raise a good family of young. Um, and they wanna come back and establish territories. Um, they're ready when the females start to arrive and they're showing off and saying, come take me and the females getting to make her choices. The adult females get the, get the first choice. Um, so, and then finally, we have, we're back to this little concept of first in, last back, last out, first back. Um, and we're going to take a look at um, one species, two species in terms of this concept. And these species, we're looking at these species because I find them mysterious. I don't understand and I, um, in my um, 
sort of start to look at what's going on have been unable to find anybody who could any research that tells me quickly why it is that these birds, which look so much alike, are uh, be behave so differently. Um, and this one here, um, we're going to talk about, this is the Swainson's thrush, the one on the left, here on the right. Um, these two are hermit thrushes. A quick look makes you say, I don't get the difference. Um, if you look at the tail, you'll notice that the um, hermits have that wonderful cinnamon rusty color in their tail, which makes it fairly easy to, to tell them apart. Um, but they're closely related birds. The um, hermit thrush um, doesn't migrate as far. Um, and uh, the Swainson's thrush goes all the way down to South America. And that's what I started looking at when I was playing with this last fall. I real, we realized that the hermits, um, which are the, the short distance migrants, some of them show up in Colorado actually in the winter time. Um, they're, they were, they're still showing up at the banding station when we close in the middle of October. The last ones in the year that we're looking at here were, in two, were on October 10th. And I think that was the last day we were there. The Swainsons, in contrast, are gone by the end of September. They're the ones that are going down to Central America. You also notice that in the fall, we catch a lot more hermits than we do Swainsons. Come spring, here's a different graph. You see two things. One is the hermits come back first, which is what we would expect. Let's see if I can go back. So, the hermits are the first, are the ones that stay the latest. They are described as sturdier birds and able to um, stay further north because of being sturdier birds, whatever that means. Um, and here we see that they're coming back first. And we see that the Swainsons come back later. But the other thing that we are seeing is that the Swainsons thrushes um, we catch more Swainsons in the spring than we do in the fall. And the opposite is true with the hermit thrushes, which I think is interesting and leads us to the next question, which is why does it seem like we see more, more migrants in the fall than we do in the spring? And there are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, there are more birds in the fall. Birds have just finished breeding. The young are still healthy and happy by the time they get, they're coming down through our part of the country, down through, um, down through Colorado. Um, and in between then and the following spring, when it's time to go back, a fair number of the, especially the young will have perished. It's a really hard journey and it's a really hard experience, especially the first time they do it. So there's simply fewer birds in the spring. And then um, there's a change in how birds, their migratory path between, between fall and spring, which is just kind of fascinating. Um, the short answer is it has to do with wind patterns, but the bird that we catch most frequently in the fall, which is the Wilson's warbler, which is the ones pictured um, here on this slide, come down out of Alaska and Canada and northern, um, the northwest part of the United States. They come down on the east side of the Rockies in the, in the fall, and they return up on the other side of the Rockies. So these thousands, literally thousands of Wilson's warblers um, that come through in the spring on the fall aren't coming through our area in the spring. We catch five, six, 700 in the fall. We're lucky if we catch two dozen in the spring. And I believe, don't have any proof of this, but my estimation is that the ones we catch in the spring are on their way up to our mountains to breed. You can see if you look at Colorado on that map, you have that tiny green splotch in the middle and that's high up in the mountains in riparian areas um, we find Wilson's breeding. So my guess is that's what's happening with the, with the few Wilson's that we actually catch in the spring. And then finally, 
in the spring, you know, we're talking hormones, we're talking about birds wanting to move. And what we find in the spring is birds don't stop. They meander in the fall, but let me tell you, they move like crazy in the spring. Um, and they won't stop unless they're starving <laughs> or unless something else happens. And that leads us back to our sort of let's be recreational birders now for a while. What is the best time to be looking for migrants in the spring? Aside from it's a beautiful day, let's go out and find birds. Anytime there's a major change in weather um, because the weather can force these birds to change their pattern, to stop if they, even if they weren't ready to. Um, and I wanna start, I wanna say next that we really don't want these storms. We don't want this to happen. Um, it's not good for the birds. It stresses them. It takes away energy that they need for other things. But if you have a major change in weather, it is possible that you will see a much larger number and more greater variety of migrants at um, the time period immediately following that. These guys, if it starts to snow in the middle of the night, they're gonna come down. The worst th thing that can happen to the feathers on the bird is to get wet. And if they're wet, they're in deep trouble. So they will come down and hunker down and wait and then probably feed for a day or two before they leave. And I have just done a study of the years of, chat, of banding at Chatfield and taking a look in putting it all together. I've been taking a look at it from some different perspectives. And one of the things I realized is that we cannot have a really big, we never have and probably can't have a really big banding season at Chatfield unless there's at least one big snowstorm. Again, we don't want it. Um, but that's when we see this increase in the number of birds. And this is the perfect example on um, the 29th at night, on the 29th of, um, of April, it started to snow. We got out to the Banny station the morning of the 30th. This picture was taken at about 6.30 um, and Three hours later, we had most of the nets defrosted and open and the sun was out and the birds were starting to move. We banded for two or three hours that day and then we banded a regular day the morning of the fifth. And on those two days, we caught 96 yellow rumped warblers. Now, we ended up the season there was a second storm. So we ended up the season with 271 yellow rumped warblers. Our average all other years was 14. And the year before we didn't catch any. These birds, they're early migrants. They're coming through. If they stop, they stay up high in the trees. Most of them aren't even gonna stop. And this storm brought them down and we just had this plethora of yellow rumped warblers. And you can see they were, the, the pictures here, they were almost all adults. Um, and we had Audubons, which are the ones with that beautiful yellow throat. We had Myrtles, where, which have that white with the wings and the really dark cheeks. And then we had even a few like the one here in the corner, which is a hybrid Myrtle Audubon with the yellow throat and the black cheeks. So. Okay, now one last thing we're gonna do, and I hope this is going to be, um, I hope this is going to work. We're gonna try something that's a little bit different than what we normally do. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about springtime in your backyards. And this is a time of year, you've had birds, tons of birds. Every time you put out food all winter long, if you're a feeder of birds, um, you've had, massive numbers of birds coming in and eating. This time of year, we're starting to get birds a little more dispersed. They're starting to mate up and breed, but we're hearing more sound. And one of the best ways to become better at recognizing birds sounds is to practice from your own home. We go back to Carson Nasser Center and that says Phoebe and 
the sound that nobody, almost nobody in the group recognized. I mean, it's hard when you're out there birding to figure out what it is. And by the time you get home, you've lost the sound. But if you're, if you're at home, you're sitting watching your birds out the window, um, you're reading the newspaper on your computer, you hear a sound, you're thinking to yourself, well, it's this or it's this. Let me listen to both of them. And you can go onto your laptop or your app or whatever and listen to a variety of calls inside in your house. It isn't disturbing the birds and oftentimes figure out what it is. And if you learn the 10 sounds that are in your backyard, it's gonna make it a whole lot easier when you go birding and you start hearing an additional batch of sounds. So Tyler, um, are you there? You are, yes. I am still here, yes. <laughs> we are going to, at this point, we are gonna unmute everybody. All right, I'm gonna ask you all to unmute. And if you feel comfortable, feel free to unmute yourself uh, to answer these questions that Meredith is gonna be bringing up. And in just a second, and I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play, these are birds, all of the birds that songs that I'm going to play, and I think I've got five of them. These are birds that almost all of you will have in your backyard now. Some a little more so than others, um, and are sounds that you are probably hearing now, or you're going to hear very soon. And um, I'm going to play it through once, um, and then when it when the song stops, I'm going to ask you to tell me. You can verbalize. What bird, what bird do you think this is? Okay, somebody wanna tell me? It was pretty quiet. Do you wanna play, play it again? Yeah. That improve it any? My oh, cat is going crazy. It's blasting this out of here. There you go. If you know it, feel free to, to shout it out. It's okay to be wrong. And the most important thing about this call, I think, is that thing at the end where it goes, ee! It sort of screeches off at the end. No votes. Mm -mm. Ah, most people are still, look, appear to be still, Tyler, the people I can see are still muted. So I gave them all a, an opportunity to unmute, but they might not be ready to unmute ah, themselves. Ah, unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to be wrong. Do you want to play it one more time, Meredith? Okay. Where'd it go? I kind of think this one sounds like if you have like a, a wooden dowel and you're like moving it back and forth on another piece of wood. Colin, Hi. I know I know Colin's here and he's unmuted. And Colin's not telling us, not telling the answer because he thinks he shouldn't. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to answer this question. That is your house finch. <laughs> so, this is, this is a song that I think we hear so much at this time of year that we're not paying any attention to it. Um, it's so common that we just, we just have closed our minds off to it. Um, but um, once you get off this call and you're listening to the birds outside again, um, you will hear it and you will recognize it. Um, so let me try another one. And um, 
And Colin, I understand you're on. Can you actually, can you hear it, Colin? Can you hear the sound? Okay. I can hear it. <laughs> Colin's not answering. All right, okay. We'll try another one and, oops. American Robin. Hey, yay. Great. Good job. And um, who, whoever answered that, can you tell us what made you, what, what hint um, told you it was a Robin? I'm hearing them every morning before dawn. <laughs> so lots of familiarity. Okay, yes. great. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so um, this one is, oops, sorry, this one is maybe a little more difficult um, because a few, they're not actually singing in our yards yet, I don't think, um, so it may be something you have to pull up out of your memory. Nice rhythm to it, three longer notes and then a bunch of uh, faster notes. Sounds like a toey. That's excellent. We got it again. And there he is, a spotted toey, abandoned spotted toey in somebody's backyard, visiting with perhaps a morning dove, which I don't have the call for. Great job. Okay, let's move on. Um, this is a bird that we are seeing more and more in our backyards um, as time has gone on. I don't yet have them in downtown Denver, but boy, there are a lot of them out in the suburban areas around Denver. I've not heard this one singing yet. No, I don't think, um, I think it's too early for them. Um, they'll uh, probably start, I, I suspect they'll start arriving in another week or so. Um, and they were, there will be millions of them out of <coughs> If you are out around the banding station, you will be hearing it and hearing it and get really sick of it. Um, and... There we have it. That is the house wren, um, which is a bird that is becoming much more common, as I mentioned early, highly adaptable little guy. And um, there you can see him either he's either feeding his young or he's putting more junk into his net nest. So it's pulled up to the top with sticks and twigs. You can see them sticking out the top. Okay, and one last final one. Um, this one, you may not, you may not get the, um, the species, but I suspect you'll get the family. I have trouble just remembering which is which. <coughs> not Hatch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. Yeah. Very good. And there we have our lovely banded red-breasted Nuthatch. Um, so, great. Um, thank you for playing our game. Um, I hope this um, encourages you to go out and look at your birds in your back. Sorry, Meredith, I accidentally muted you. Would you mind unmuting? Uh, yes. There you go. Am I unmuted now? You're uh, good. Thank you. Last slide, just to remind you or to let you know for the first time this year, um, we are going to be banding at 
at Chatfield this spring. We will be open for business as of the 26th of April for five weeks. We're closed on Tuesdays. To visit this year, you absolutely have to make a reservation. This is a COVID issue and um, we did it last fall at Bar, um, and it worked really successfully. So we're gonna continue it this spring. Um, go to www.denveraudubon.org slash events um, to register. We have one hour blocks in on weekdays, 7.30 a.m. On weekends, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30. Um, Bird Conservancy and Audubon members slash donors are free. Everybody else pays $6 a person. Um, if, this, if you need nothing else to encourage you to make your first gift to Bird Conservancy, this is a perfect time to do it. Um, no more than 10 people per hour. That allows us to physically distance between individuals and families and groups that don't know each other. And it also allows us to have everybody sit down um, because an hour is a pretty long time to be standing. Um, we will be maintaining whatever COVID restrictions are in place. Um, this is a great way to get outside um, and do something really fun and enjoyable at a time when we're just really still needing um, those sorts of experiences. And I will end with something that won't move. Ah, okay. And with the, um, if you are, have been participating in and enjoying these webinars and other activities of the Bird Conservancy, um, please, consider joining our flock. Um, contributions are particularly important now as other funding sources are a little bit um, unpredictable given the current um, COVID situation and everything else. Um, deeply appreciate those of you on the call who are donors. I saw the list and I know that there are a number of you in, in the on the call today and it is very much appreciated and it means that we can continue to um, help to conserve birds and their habitat. So we have a few minutes and, well, we don't have a few minutes, but I am more than willing to stay on if there are questions, Tyler. Um, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Meredith. That was, so, so many, that was just great information. And I, I know I'm really excited about spring migration. I've been working in my backyard and, and listening and getting my my songs of my birds back in my head in my backyard. So it is a great way to practice. Um, it's what I do, and I'm sure it's a lot of what we, a lot of us do. Um, will will we be or will you be banding on Mother's Day? Um, we will be banding on Mother's Day, but there is going to be a Mother's Day has traditionally been a day when the Bird Conservancy, when not the Bird Conservancy, when Audubon does a one of their major fundraisers, and so you will be able to come out, but you really need to go on right away and see where um, Audubon is in terms of signing people up. Um, but they, they normally do food and it's really quite delightful, but the food part isn't gonna happen this year because of the COVID restrictions. Awesome. So it looks like you must have answered a lot of people's questions with that very informative webinar. Um, and it looks like we are up on that hour. So. I just want to say thank you to everyone that has participated. Um, if you do have questions that come, come up, feel free to email us. Um, we will love to answer them or go out to the banding station and see Meredith uh, this spring. I know I'm going to try to sneak out there a couple of times uh, to help with uh, some virtual programming there. Um, but thank you all so much. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Uh, we do currently have bird walks that we're offering, in-person bird walks uh, out at Bar Lake uh, that we'll be offering through the month of April. Uh, those are on Mondays as well as Saturdays uh, with groups of up to 10 um, and their physical distance. We'll be wearing masks. Uh, if you want any more information about any of the events, we are actually getting quite busy this spring. Uh, feel free to check out our Bird Conservancy events calendar uh, and they're all up on there. Um, so I'll look forward to an email coming later this afternoon with the recording and other information. Um, and again, thank you so much, Meredith, for another great webinar. And we'll see you all maybe in person or at a future webinar.